One of the cliches of going back to school is the essay on what I did in my summer vacation. Tonight, I'd like to talk about what I did on my COVID vacation. I bought the boat in what could be called a fit of enthusiasm at the Adirondack Experience Antique Show in 2015. The seller thought it was a Parsons boat, which would date it anywhere between 1890 and 1945, but probably closer to the earlier date, as they were not very active after 1920. It is not. It is a UFO, or unidentified floating object. It is missing many of the characteristics of the several iterations of a Parsons boat. It is not a Grant boat, nor is it a Sieber boat. Each of these builders' boats have well-known design features, as well as some sort of numbering system. It may have been built by either Ansel Wilder or Orrin Fenton, both active in the years around the turn of the 20th century. But it does not completely match their known boats either. It is, however, a Browns tracked style boat made in the western Adirondacks. The boat was reputed to come off of Big Moose Lake near Old Forge. This is in John Brown's tract and near the shops of all the builders mentioned. Brown's tract is the name given to a large parcel of land sold to John Brown's son-in-law in 1798. Brown, a Providence merchant, tried to settle the area, but all attempts failed and settlement was abandoned by 1825, but the name stuck. A Browns tracked boat refers to a guide boat built in this western part of the Adirondacks. The most obvious difference is the shape of the stem. Eastern Adirondack boats, or Saranac style boats, have varying degrees of tumble home to the stems. Browns tracked boats have a forward raking stem more suited to the lakes in the western part of the park. Dwight Grant started building boats in Boonville with a slight tumble home, but quickly extended the stem profile. Most, if not all, Brown's tracked builders at one point worked for Grant in his boat shop. The boat was entombed in several coats of paint. I poked at all the likely locations for rot, and it appeared to be sound. About a dozen ribs had been sistered, and I was told the boat leaked a bit until it had a good soak, not unusual for an old wooden boat. The seats were mismatched and did not appear to be all of the same age as the boat. The vendor said he was told that Lewis Grant, son of Dwight Grant, had done repairs to the boat. Lewis was also a skilled boat builder, and some of the sistering appears to have been done by someone who knew what they were doing. Some of the other work, however, was not the work of a knowledgeable guideboat builder. The metal stem caps were busted. One was missing the half that extended over the stem horn. The one shown here was broken halfway through. I eventually fabricated new caps from O40 brass and had them nickel plated to match the originals. The shoe irons were gone. Shoe irons run the length of the bottom board to protect it when the boat is pulled up on shore. They also cover the joint between the bottom board and the garboard. Ultimately, the only bits of soft wood I found were at some of the screw holes for the shoe irons, which had only been filled with paint when the boat was repainted. In restoring the boat, I opted to follow Chris Woodward's practice and make the shoe irons from hardwood. When the boat is upside down in bright sun, the 16th inch by half inch metal shoe irons would expand enough to buckle and eventually pull out some of the screws. The hardwood does not do that. Hammer's Boat Shop started doing this in 1940. Brass floor plates are located where the guide's boots would brace when rowing either from the middle or front seat. They are designed to protect the bottom board from wear and extend up and partly over the associated rib. They were badly cracked and deteriorated. I ultimately replaced them with new O20 brass plates. <laughs> 
None of the obvious problems appeared overwhelming. It appeared a reasonable restoration candidate. The boat had held its shape and was reasonably sound. I had in some years past thought I would like to build a guide boat, and this looked like a good way to get to work on one without starting from scratch. The boat came with a set of oars which you can see on the dock in the background. They are nice old red maple oars which, with a refinish, would serve well. However, you will note that the oar on the left has a bit of a bend. It has been broken or cracked in the past and fairly clumsily repaired with fiberglass. It is sound and flex as well, but it's just a bit off. It may or may not get repaired depending on, you know, whatever. This is how I did the restoration. I'm sure there are other methods that will work equally well as well or better, but these worked for me. A guide boat is different from a wood canvas canoe, both in the way it is built and how it is propelled. A wood canvas canoe is built on a form. Flat ribs are steamed and bent over the form and attached to the end whales. Then the planks come together with a butt joint and are tacked to the ribs. Canoes are paddled facing forward. Some are equipped with sails. Guide boats are rowboats. They were first developed in the 1850s at Martin's Hotel in Saranac Lake. Initially, they had a wine glass style transom. They evolved over the next 30 years to the double-ended form familiar today. The drivers of this evolution were lightness, carrying capacity, and stability. Intended for use by guides, they have been called the pickup truck of the Adirondacks. A guide boat is a pattern boat. Ribs and stems are sawn from spruce stumps and screwed to a tapering bottom board to form the skeleton of the boat. Each builder had his own set of patterns for each part, and there was a lot of subtle variation from one builder to the next. Stem profiles, rib patterns, and other details provide clues to a particular boat's builder. Once the skeleton is complete, planks are cut to pattern and hung. Where canoe planks are just butted together, guide bolt planks are lapped with tapered edges to yield a smooth, waterproof skin inside and out. The planks are tacked together with roughly 4,200 tacks and screwed to the ribs and bottom board with half-inch screws. Durant, in his book, counted 2,185 screws in an average 16-foot boat. I would like to thank the Adirondack Experience for the use of this drawing. The first step was to remove the paint. Bob Lemoy and I, over two afternoons, removed several layers. There was enough paint on the boat to require several bouts of stripper. We allowed the stripper to work, then gave it a gentle pressure wash. The planking on a guide boat is 3 sixteenths of an inch thick, so sanding is not appropriate. When installing new ribs, I gave the interior a light hand sand in way of the new rib with 220 paper to remove any remaining paint schmutz. The boat was never a bright boat, so some remnants of the original paint remain. There were no surprises on the exterior. I knew some of the planks were cracked, but none were fatal and all could be glued back together. The inside was a different story. The lower six planks had been painted red, possibly red lead, while the bottom board, shear plank, and ribs were not. I can only assume that they were painted before they were hung. As tenacious as the black exterior and green interior paint was, the red was much more so. It had almost dyed the planks and ultimately did not all come out. It ended up better than shown here, where there's a bit more cleanup needed in the stern. Removing the paint also revealed more cracked and broken ribs. The count went from about a dozen to ultimately 28, half the ribs in the boat. And the neighbors kept asking what kind of a canoe it was. 
I was almost at the point of putting up a sign saying, no, it is not a canoe, it's a guideboat. This is the stern of the guideboat sitting in the rolling cradle where it has lived for the past several years. One of the attractions of guideboats for me is the grace of the combined shear and hull lines. You cannot see in the picture, but the builder's scribe marks are still visible on the exterior of the stem. The builder was very careful in some of his measurements, but not in others. Removing the paint revealed more problems. As mentioned earlier, while it first appeared that a dozen or so ribs had been sistered, ultimately 28 ribs needed attention. The problems ranged from multiple cracks and breaks to ribs that were half worn away from use over the years. I think the only thing that stopped this rib from wearing further was the attachment screw sticking up through the remains of the rib. You will also notice that the grain of the rib does not follow the curve of the rib. The wear here follows the grain lines. On many of the failed ribs, the fracture occurred on grain lines not aligned with the rib itself. Carelessness, lack of appropriate material, lack of attention, lack of experience, who knows, everyone who does know is dead. In addition to wear and abuse, I think a contributing factor to the rib failure was the size of the ribs themselves. Grant built his ribs three quarters of an inch thick. These are five eighths. The procedure for making a new rib was straightforward. First, I removed the existing failed rib. I then used it to make a rough pattern. I held the pattern in place and scribed it to the boat, then used the pattern to make a bending form. Since I wanted to use the old ribs to make a pattern, I needed to take them out as gently as possible. Each rib is held in place by about 25 screws through the planking and the bottom board. The boat was built with iron screws that had been in for what I believe is over 100 years. Having been there for so long, they were not anxious to come out. In addition, most were buried in putty. I found the easiest way to get them out was to start with a soldering iron. This photo shows the selection of tools I used. Soldering iron, dental explorers to dig out softened putty, a selection of screwdrivers, pliers, and a screw lifter. For the half-inch screws through the planking, about a 10 count worked to break them loose. The one-inch screws through the bottom board into the rib foot could take 30 seconds, sometimes longer. Because of the care taken, removing a rib took about an hour. Most of the screws were in good enough shape to back out. Some, however, looked more like misformed tacks, all the threads gone with only part of the root remaining. The pairs at the top show the difference in the better and worse screws. The screw at the bottom is one of my favorites. It was through the gunnel and planking into the end of a deck beam. The joint had separated when the screw started to fail. With the head buried in the gunnel, it was hard to get out, but it finally yielded. Some of the ribs, especially those which had been sistered, came out in one piece. Others came out in two or three pieces. Most came out readily, but some were held in place by paint that had gotten under the rib or the rib sister. When taking out ribs, you cannot take out two consecutive ribs. You have to leave one on each side of the rib you are removing to keep the boat shape. This limitation and the time needed to fabricate a new rib generally limited me to removing three ribs at a time. That was also about the limit of my patience with the process. <clears throat> this photo shows a rib and the pattern made for the replacement. I made the patterns out of quarter inch MDF and in the course of the project used a quarter sheet. The pattern was purposely made long the rib foot was trimmed when the rib was installed, the shear end after all the ribs were in. Guy boat ribs are numbered from 0 to 12, with the spacing and number of pairs of zero ribs dictating the length. 
This boat has five pairs of zero ribs. The ribs are made in pairs which keeps the boat symmetrical side to side and bow to stern. Knowing this and thinking I now had over two dozen ribs to do, I was at least comforted that I could make ten ribs on one form. But no, this boat had been repaired more than once and the zero ribs were not the same port to starboard. The difference was slight and I was advised not to worry about fractional discrepancies. So I would need a form for each side. Guide boats were and are built with ribs sawn from spruce crooks. Spruce stumps are dug up and sawn into planks. Then the ribs are laid out so the pattern follows the curving grain as the trunk joins the roots. Many of the failed ribs showed short grain where the builder did not have the right curve in his crooks or did not take care in laying out his ribs. Logging practices today do not leave many stumps in the woods. Chainsaws and feller bunchers cut trees at ground level, not waist high like a two-man misery whip did. They can be had, but I do not have access to spruce stumps or sawn crooks. My option was to laminate the ribs. This yields a stronger and somewhat stiffer rib, still flexible enough for a guide boat. And I do have some reasonably clear air dried spruce I could saw into laminations. Rather than use a standard 10 inch combination blade to saw the strips, I bought a seven and a quarter inch 40 tooth Diablo trim blade from Home Depot. This blade cuts easily through the air dried spruce and leaves the glue ready surface. It also has a kerf of 5 64ths of an inch, so much less wood is wasted as sawdust. The board I used is about two inches thick. It had some cup and twist, which I jointed out and then planed the other side parallel. I did not soak or steam the strips and had some minor breakage, so I cut extra and have some leftovers for another project. Plan one was a manual airbag from Roar Rocket. The company caters to the DIY skateboard market and makes a good product. The bag does not need an electric pump to pull the vacuum and hold it as some larger bags do. It ships with a manual pump, but I could also draw most of the vacuum with my shop vac and finish it off with a manual pump. Once the vacuum is drawn, it holds overnight long enough for the glue to cure. I hoped it would give consistent pressure over the length of the rib, but the bends were severe enough that it would not bend eighth inch laminations tight enough for a good glue up. I had to use 16th inch strips four at a time. This limitation and the shape I was bending and possible pilot error meant it did not work well for my application. Clamping directly onto a form worked better. This form was made from two layers of foam insulation glued together with a plywood base to hold the form vertical. Plan B used a bending form made from two layers of three-quarter MDF. I started with the O-ribs, still making blanks big enough for two ribs. Once those were done, since the ribs get tighter as the boat narrows, I could make the form for the next size from the larger form. I ended up using a minimal amount of material by repurposing forms. I made the rib blanks 7 8 inch thick with a bit extra at the heel. This gave me enough material to route to the pattern I made, especially the heel area. The existing ribs are small, 5 16 thick by 5 8 of an inch deep. Once the rib blanks were set, I ran them over the jointer to get a flat side, then through the planer to clean up the other side. I could then saw the blank in half for two ribs. I started off planing the ribs to final thickness, but partway through I bought a drum sander, which did a better job with finer control. 
The next step was to attach the pattern to the blank with double-sided tape and pattern route the rib to final size. I ruined one rib before I realized how easy it was to edge set the MDF pattern, so I needed to be careful when attaching the pattern. Once trimmed, I routed a slight round over on the inside face and sanded to smooth out the profile. I measured and trimmed the foot and was almost ready to install my new rib. Almost. The ribs are perpendicular to the center line of the boat, but the planking at the shear is not. Each rib is beveled in way of the planking, and it is a rolling bevel, meaning it changes over the length of the rib. And since the curve of the planking changes, generally no two adjacent ribs bevel the same. My solution was to mark the new and old ribs every two inches, starting at the shear, and use a sliding T-bevel to transfer the bevel to the new rib filing it at each mark. I could then connect the bevels to fare the rib to the hull. The bevel is in many cases minimal, but without it the rib does not sit right. This is the number two port stern rib. I reused the majority of the existing screw holes in attaching the new ribs. Not all of the builder screws went dead center of the ribs, and some were only half in the rib. I tried to redrill those holes to center the screws in the rib as well as I could, but some are still too close, although completely in the rib. I began by clamping the foot of the rib to its mate and the other end to the gunnel. With the rib somewhat secured, I could drill the gunnel screw and then climb under the boat to screw down the foot. Then I could install two or three screws spaced along the rib all of which would keep it in place until I turned the boat over and I could work upright. When I needed new holes in the bottom board, I drilled them from the inside and dropped small finish nails in the new holes. That way, once under the boat, I could find the hole I wanted to use and drill the rib. Working overhead wearing bifocals is tricky. I drilled each screw hole with a countersink bit as I did not want to split my new laminated ribs. I did the drilling with a Miller's Falls two-way cordless drill. Sometimes it just needed one more revolution of the countersink to be just right, hard to do with an electric drill. The ribs were originally fastened with a combination of number three and number four half-inch iron screws. I chose to use number four half-inch brass screws. In replacing 28 ribs, I used about 750 screws. That leaves another 750 for the next owner to replace. Why should I have all the fun? Allison Warner, the boat builder at the Adirondack Experience, suggested another way to rehab ribs. She suggested splining the ribs. Her reasoning is that this preserves more of the original material of the boat. I had two that were not too bad and decided to give it a try. First, before removing the rib, I tacked the rib back together by wicking CA glue into the cracks. I then jigged up the rib so that I could run it through my table saw with a 10 inch blade. This left an eighth inch slot in the center of the rib. I cut some eighth inch strips of spruce and glued them in. At least this uses fewer clamps. When the glue was dry, I trimmed the spline with a spoke shave and put the rib back in the boat. This did leave some miscellaneous screw holes in the rib where the seat risers were attached. I filled them with an epoxy putty, quick wood, which I hoped would strengthen the area in addition to filling the hole. And finally finished, at least with the ribs. The decks have also been glued back together with some splits filled in with spruce. The deck caps were reattached with 3 8 inch number three brass screws. The cap on the stern deck had to be ended out with a bit of spruce. <laughs> 
The Comings had also seen better days. They had major losses, worn down to the level of the decks in many places, along with assorted splits and other losses. They were made of ash, which would bend easily. I made new blanks about three inches high. The blank had to be that high, about twice the height of the finished combing, because the combing curves in two dimensions. The combings are also thinner on the ends than in the middle. Not much, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, but enough to be noticeable. Rather than steam them, I cooked them in a hot water bath for 20 minutes before I bent them around to form. I left them in the clamps overnight to set the curve, which even with some spring back was close enough to fit them to the boat. I sent a photo to a friend who asked if I thought I had used enough clamps. On reflection, I thought he might be right and added a few more. I first trimmed the ends to fit I then traced the bottom of the deck carlins on the back of the combing, cut the bottom an eighth inch over size, and rounded over the edge. The top was a bit trickier, as it rises from flush with the decks at the sides of the boat to eighth inch proud of the deck cap in the center. This was marked, then cut to shape and rounded over like the bottom. With the combing securely clamped to the carlin, I used a jig to draw a line on the front of the combing along the center line of the carlin. I could then use dividers to evenly space screws and got out my trusty cordless drill to install the screws. The only place I found any soft wood was in the shoe iron screw holes in the bottom board. Someone had removed the shoe irons, probably to paint the boat and not put them back on. Fortunately, the paint sealed the majority of the screw holes. There were a few, a dozen or so, that were somewhat punky. I drilled them out and filled them with git rot, a thin epoxy designed for this purpose. When the git rot dried, the holes were firm and sound. I then drilled all the screw holes and plugged them with spruce plugs, about 100 plugs. When the glue dried, I sawed and paired the plugs flush and filled any remaining divots with putty. The new hardwood shoe irons are attached with number four half inch brass screws on roughly three inch centers. As of this writing, the boat is now waiting on a nice spring day so I can take it out in the backyard and paint it. I'm using Kirby semi-gloss oil paint. The plan is a medium gray on the inside, dark blue on the outside, and black for the gunnels and decks. New seats have been fabricated from curly maple and as soon as I'm happy with the varnish, they'll be caned. All the hardware has been replated, so it is ready to install when the paint's dry. I hope that by the time you see this presentation, I will be happily rowing around the lake. Some of the books on guideboats and guideboat building that I have found useful are shown here. Durant's book was the earliest and includes measured drawings of the Virginia, one of the Grant boats at the Adirondack Experience. He also has tack and screw counts. Dr. Solovic's book has an expanded history based on his extensive research, as well as the field guide to guide boats. Listed are all known boat builders, dates, locations, number of boats built, along with boat characteristics, to help identify the builder's product. Olivet and Mishni's book covers building a strip-built reproduction of the Virginia with laminated ribs. Dr. Fisher's book gives the history of a family chase boat and his reproduction of that boat. The Adirondack Experience also has available drawing sets with construction lines of various boats in their collection. Thank you and good night.